You are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Vanatini. Here, I interview brain scientists of all types and discuss their work, as well as the latest developments, issues, and controversies in the field of brain map. Today, I have four pioneers in MRI and fMRI talking about the emerging and extremely exciting field of layer fMRI, imaging at high enough resolutions to actually resolve to some degree cortical layers. So my four guests, the first guest is Reiner Goebel. He is a full professor for cognitive neuroscience at Maastricht University. He's been a fountainhead of innovation with fMRI. And he's also, as many of you know, the creator of Brain Voyager. It's a processing platform. FMRI. He has an ultra high field imaging center that houses three Tesla, seven Tesla, and even a 9.4 Tesla human scanner. He received his PhD from the Technical University of Braunschweig, where he developed artificial deep neural networks to advance our understanding of visual processing computations. From 1995 to 99, he did his postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt in Wolf Singer's department, where, as is mentioned in a podcast, he was actually discouraged from doing fMRI, but he plowed through and his, his prescient vision at the time of what fMRI may accomplish is actually, as evidenced by layer fMRI, is actually coming to fruition today. So my second guest on the podcast is David Feinberg. He is a professor at Berkeley and is known over the years of being somewhat of a pulse sequence wizard. He's come up with many insights into how to have the scanner collect information more efficiently. He's also the director of AMRIT. It's an advanced MRI technologies company for doing research and development in in clinical imaging. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and also did his postdoc at UCSF. And and as mentioned, he's been innovating in the field in many different ways, developing high-speed acquisition techniques, among other things. And he's also, as we'll talk about in the podcast, has a pretty exciting project with a local head grading coil that's extremely high performance at 70 to image uh, due layer fMRI, essentially, uh, among other things. So John Polomini is a physicist and an engineer at the MGH Martino Center. So he's been working in all things cutting edge with MRI, and he received his PhD from Boston University in the Computation Neuroscience and Computer Vision Laboratory under Professor Eric Schwartz. He did some very early seminal work on layer fMRI with some of the first convincing demonstra- demonstrations that layer fMRI was possible. So finally, I have Renzo Huber on this podcast. And Renzo has devoted his entire career to layer fMRI. And he has produced not only some seminal papers already that have shown that this observation of imaging layers is real and useful, but also along with this groundbreaking and deeply important work for developing novel high-resolution techniques that not only image at high resolution spatially, but also are sensitive to smaller vessels. So to, these methods avoid large vessels, which allow you to get higher functional resolution, which is critical at this resolution. He also has established a extremely valuable layer fMRI blog. It's layerfmri.com that, among other things, includes a list of all the papers and abstracts published in layer fMRI in the entire field and available code for processing and tutorials, a discussion of carbon artifacts, a map of all 70 scanners throughout the world. Now approaching, last time I checked, it was over 80 or so, but it's probably approaching about 100 now. And also even a section on brain art. He's, he's kind of an artistic uh, person as well. So before college, and we'll talk about this also in the podcast, Renzo received all his education from what's called a Waldorf school in Salzburg, Austria. There's Waldorf schools all over the world. And and they have a very unique approach to education, which I think I think Renzo is a is a perfect uh, product of that in some regard. He he goes about things in a in a in a very fundamental way. He looks for fundamental principles and is very intuitive and visceral. Thinks about things. So I think that probably helped him a lot. So look up the Waldorf schools. Uh, it's a, they're interesting. So he received his PhD under Bob Turner at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And then uh, I was lucky enough to have him carry out his postdoc in my group at the NIH, where he produced several groundbreaking papers and has con- now continues to benefit the field. So he's now working in Reiner's uh, Center at Maastricht under the direction of Ben Poser, who's sort of his 
mentor. So this was this actually was a truly special podcast to me. And without spending too much time describing exactly what we talked about, because it, this podcast highlights one of the, to me at least, most one of the most exciting and important emerging areas in fMRI, and that of imaging layer activity. The resolving of layer activity is, is so exciting because it opens up the prospect of determining the direction of commu communication between areas. Rather than just having blobs of areas activating, you start to now have, oh, this area is talking to this area. So you're able to resolve top-down and bottom-up influences, which the brain is organized around. So brain activity is so much more than just regions, but rather regions sending information to other regions. And this information opens up to po the possibility to fully map these directional uh, communication channels and understand in more detail hierarchy uh, of processing. And layer fMRI truly pushes the limits of fMRI and MRI. So it requires high field, high signal to noise that comes with high field, it requires specialized hardware and, and also pulse sequences. And importantly, specialized processing methods. You have to find ways of segmenting the brain on a cortical level and pulling out the, the layer, uh, cortical layer areas. So only a, a small handful of groups in the world are leading this charge. And we're lucky enough to talk to a few of the individuals from those groups uh, doing this. And in this discussion, we talk about all these issues in imaging high resolution imaging layers. And we get into some discussion about contrast mechanisms and hardware and and all kinds of interesting things. And not only that, we end the discussion with a discussion of prospects for layer fMRI. And everyone who's doing it is, is quite excited about how it will open up not only neuroscience, but potential clinical applications of fMRI that are only revealed through looking at layer uh, activity. So with that, uh, get ready for a great discussion. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, all four of you, for coming on to the OHPM Neurosalience podcast. Uh, we have Reiner Goebel, David Feinberg, John Polomini, and Renzo Huber, and they've been pushing the envelope in MRI and fMRI for, for years. Uh, and uh, right now, the one of the most exciting envelope edges of fMRI has been layer fMRI. So we're going to be talking about uh, everything layer fMRI. But just to begin, uh, I'll maybe ask each of you to just briefly introduce yourself so people can associate your, you know, your name with your voice if they, if they don't know you. Uh, maybe I'll start with Reiner. Welcome, Reiner. Hi, Peter. Hi. Yeah. All right. Uh, and 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 David. <laughs> sure. Hi, Peter. Uh, nice to be here. Okay. <coughs> and and John. Hello, Peter. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, and, and finally, Renzo. Hi, Peter. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's a great honor. I, I really am a big fan of the podcast. Yeah. Oh well, thank you, thank you. I'm I'm slowly but surely uh, uh, getting better at this, but um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation too. Uh, so so just before we start, I, I like to sort of lay out a perspective for the uh, the younger people um, who are listening to this. You know, how you first became interested in MRI um, or neuroscience. I mean, I think most of you are physicists or engineers, except, well, Reiner, of course, is an engineer, but, <laughs> um, and, and, and a computer scientist, but also a, neuro, a little bit more of a neuroscientist than, than, the, than the other three, I would say. And, and so maybe starting with Reiner, how did you first, uh, what, what people most influenced you or how did you first become interested in, in MRI or the application of MRI uh -huh. in neuroscience? Yeah, I'm actually um, um, studied psychology, cognitive psychology and perception and computer science also indeed. And then had my later training in a neuroscience institute in Germany in the Max Planck Institute under Wolf Singer, which was a great time. And, um, you know, I, I stumbled um, very early on the question to really want to understand how the mind is created by the brain. This is the overarching question. And when I joined Wolf Singer's lab in, in, in Frankfurt, he appointed me basically to do some neural net modeling, what I had done for several years for my PhD, uh, for oscillatory phenomena, like binding things across space and so on, um, which was on vogue at that time very much. It still is. But at that time, the breakthroughs were made. right? And the second thing is he, he asked me to, to learn to do monkey electrical recordings, which I also did for, to some extent. But I then read papers about fMRI. You know, it was in the mid-90s, I should say. And that especially when I saw the retinal topic mapping from Sereno and others, uh, Rumelhardt and Engel, whatever you have, 
When I saw these papers, I was hooked. And I told Wolf Singer, listen, I want to stop this so much modeling. I want to stop doing monkeys. I want to do human fMRI, you know? And then he asked me, why? This is a nonsense uh, method. You, you never get what you want to do. You told me you want to know how features, how columns, how layers work. This you cannot do. And I told him, listen, if they can do retinotopy, maybe in some years they can do layers and columns. That is actually how I came in this field. And had from that day, this was 90, end of 94, from that day, I have this interest to go to, to layers and columns. That's, and the reason, of course, is to understand how the brain processes information at a detailed level, not just saying these areas are active. I was never interested in that. But to really say the brain does not this step, has this information that transforms it to that and, and, and reasons. And, and what is the content? What is going on there? How information is exchanged to understand cognition, consciousness, these things, perception. This is what I was really interested to go in, 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 in human fMRI. So that, that was pretty prescient back then. And, and, but it's actually an interesting point you bring up because, I mean, I think we might talk about this a little bit later too, is that, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, just simply cartography versus understanding mechanisms and, and somehow the idea that understanding smaller and smaller units leads you to uh, start to explain mechanisms a little bit more than just mapping where uh, large areas are. But where does that, it seems like a continuum to some degree. I think it's very important because you do not understand the mechanism if you do not understand the structure underlying the mechanism. So I'm I'm also a great fan of mapping and even especially at columnar mapping uh, across the tangential dimension of the cortex and of course the layers uh, in the depths of the cortex. So I think mapping is super important because then you can understand when it's operated, you know which parts of this mapped architecture is used for what? Then you can infer this more fine-grained mapping. You can infer more and more also details of what's going on in the mind. We have recently published a paper um, about neural correlates of consciousness with laminar fMRI and columnar fMRI, where we used ambiguous figures, which you can see either horizontally or vertically moving. And the physical stimulus is the same, but your brain decides what to perceive. And in this experiment, we could relate uh, at the columnar and laminar level, what the subject currently perceives, what interpretation he has yes. from very neighboring architecture of, of columnar and laminar um, organization. So you need to understand this level to really disentangle what a person currently perceives. And that's why I'm interested in this mesoscopic scale level. Yes. Yeah. I think that's, it's rich with possibility in terms of deriving principles in some sense as well. And, and definitely, I hope to be talking about that more a uh, little bit, a little bit further, but so, but let's just go on to David. David, a little bit about your uh, background. What, what first interested you? Sure. Um, well, when I was in graduate school, uh, MRI was really just starting out. And um, I, my work at that time was more in, you know, uh, solid state physics, uh, and really diffraction imaging with Fourier uh, theory. Uh, and I was very much interested in pushing resolution. And, but that was more looking at molecular structure and protein. And uh, there was a visiting speaker to a class I was attending, just auditing and engineering. And, it, and he showed the first uh, echo planar images, uh, movie images of from Peter Mansfield's group showing a beating heart. And I just thought this is fantastic if we could push the resolution and somehow combine things that led me, I, I just, I, I, I can't tell you how my whole focus at that early point was to work on uh, extending resolution. There's probably something Freudian about it because my father was a photographer, but we won't go there. And, um, you know, so I, I, my first work, I joined an MRI hardware group across the Bay Radiologic Imaging Lab, and we were building the first clinical MR scanner, this being around 83. And I wasn't an electrical engineer. I was a, a a physicist, so I was assigned to work on pulse sequences, which I really liked. And, you know, some of the early techniques that I developed, um, which one was inner volume imaging, which was uh, later called zoomed imaging, the first imaging technique, and then partial Fourier imaging, which is a more generally used technique, are, are, were all used in in fMRI uh, later, particularly with the Minnesota group where they were doing columnar imaging. And that, that really was when I got into uh, functional MRI, realizing that some of the other techniques that I developed 
uh, grace technique and others uh, could be applied to fMRI. So yeah, my work really was developing general MRI pulse sequence techniques, but I was always uh, very interested in, in neuroscience. Yeah. 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 I also have to say that, you know, of, I, you know, looking at the history of MRI, I would say that you're probably one of a handful at the most of people who've been sort of truly innovating in pulse sequences over the years. So, I mean, I, I, it's really impressive just, you know, spending a little bit of time in the last week looking at your what you've been doing, it's, you know, it's really has been, uh, you know, there's been a lot of really major advances uh, related to your pulse programming. Uh, yeah. so. Thank you. Not to take much time on this, uh, but, you know, one of the greatest experiences for me with, came really only in the last few years when I got to know quite well the inventor of pulse sequences, which is uh, Erwin Hahn, and we, most people identify him with spin echoes, but he really created all echoes and the basic technique of, of, of what we use in MRI. So I think one of the advantages being, I consider myself more of a second generation MRI scientist. Han was even pre-MRI, but you know, I got to know Peter Mansfield and, and others. And I think it's just a wonderful thing about the MRI field. And even now I saw, you know, Gary Glover, who was uh, a senior scientist at GE, move into fMRI quite before me. And you know, I just thought that that's, that's great. And I, uh, it, it fit very well with what I want to do, but I'm a very different scientist than Gary. And so my emphasis is very different. All right, John, what's, what's your history as far as that's concerned? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, yeah, I guess I have a sort of very distinct kind of entry point because, you know, I started off as an electrical engineer and I started working in a laboratory that was building these uh, silicon retinas using analog VLSI. So my job, you know, as a research assistant was to kind of solder the boards and build the kind of uh, control equipment, but also to help with the design. I really learned there, you know, using neuromorphic principles, you know, how uh, these brain computations could be enacted, you know, um, you know, trying to learn about, you know, brain computation. And I was fascinated. I was fascinated by these silicon retinas. And I asked my advisor, you know, how can I continue to work in this domain, but also learn more about the neuroscience, you know, more, learn more about, you know, the neurons that are underlying these computations. And he said, go work with Eric Schwartz. And so I went to work with Eric Schwartz as a PhD, you know, started off, you know, starting with the machine vision, you know, trying to look at these foveated networks, uh, foveated uh, uh, sensor networks, uh, but then moving on to optical imaging, you know, looking at the resolution limits of optical imaging to try to interpret, you know, our ability to map out cortical columns. And then from there, models of the human visual system, as Reiner had said, you know, the models of the retinotopic mapping you know, cartography. And so Eric, you know, he was, uh, you know, one of the originators of, you know, the computational neuroscience paradigm. Yeah. And Eric's point of view, kind of building on what, what Reiner had said was that, you know, if we're trying to analogize, we're trying to understand, you know, the brain as a computer, which is still a pretty decent analogy, I think. You know, the question is, you know, in order to understand, you know, the algorithms, you know, can really benefit to understand the data structures, you know, and, you know, topography was a present, you know, data structure that was present not only in the visual system, basically all sensory systems had topography. So the yeah. question is, you know, this is a conspicuous relationship, you know, conspicuous mapping of the you know, sensory world onto the cortex. And so this must have some kind of, um, you know, give us some insights into the algorithms that the brain is trying to implement. So, yeah, so I think the idea of trying to map out these data structures, you know, it gives us a lot of insight into how the computations or algorithms are implemented in the brain. And, and I actually don't see, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing more of it, but it's, it's actually interesting, the interaction between, for instance, AI and, uh, and fMRI or, or MRI or neuroscience in general, trying to inform algorithms in some sense. But we're not, it seems like we're not quite at that level yet where we, where we can actually distinctly inform them. But we, at some level, I mean, we're at a scale where we can start to uh, uh, at least say certain things more more concretely. But um, yeah. Uh, and then you went to MGH, of course, and, and yes. uh, you've been... Next yeah, <laughs> basically only because, you know, we, we built these, you know, models of, you know, the visual system, we built these models of topography, you know, we tested them mostly with histology or microelectrode data, you know, but we wanted to see if they would generalize to humans. And fMRI was our only ticket to be able to do that. And so we went to MGH to work with Ari Wald, you know, try to see if we could, you know, make these measurements to test these models originally, these uh, retinotopic models. And uh, yeah, that, that was my starting off point. Um, again, fMRI, you know, it's a, a terrific technology, I think, you know, not only because it's available in humans, but because we can image 
such kind of broad regions of the brain. You know, I think that's one of the most exciting things to me about fMRI is that instead of just looking at the brain through like a very small window, you know, it's possible to look at interactions across the entire brain, look at, you know, very kind of large expanses of the cortex. Yes. Um, and th this is what was required for us to test our models, you know, the 2D kind of layout of these topographic maps. And yeah, so that kind of got me hooked, you know, the fact that we could do this in humans over large regions. Yeah, never went back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, and and yeah, like I said, we're we're going to delve into that a little bit more a little bit later. But um, but Renzo, finally, you're the youngest of the group. You've been completely focused on layer fMRI since probably the start of your uh, uh, at least since your PhD. Um, how did you get started as far as that's concerned? What brought drew you to this? It was more random and and um, coincidence and maybe my a bit portion of of naivety on my, my part. Like I'm a physicist, so I was working on particle physics, which is maybe frustrating sometimes because it's not so approachable, right? Like the human mind, however, everybody I guess is curious about it. So so I, I was trying to find ways between physics and, and uh, like and that the brain and, and the mind, how the mind works. I was particularly trying to to program curiosity in a little robot with in Munich where I studied. However, most of the professors there found this as rather esoteric and wouldn't take me as a master student. So I just typed into Google physics and neuro and voila, Bob Turner appeared right on the first hits in Google neurophysics. <laughs> and then they were looking for like student helpers, master students to work on adiabatic pulses. And I figured I know thermodynamic, I know adiabatic pulses. I packed my bag and went there. Little did I know that it was radio frequency pulses and MRI, right? So so I, I, I worked on adiabatic pulses for, for VASO, which they want me to do. And VASO is this method that has a few areas of application, maybe the quantifiability, which was not really my major focus. And however, it's also has a high localization specificity. So I so that was kind of one application point and I discovered uh, like high resolution fMRI, particularly inspired by you seeing Guernsey and Jonathan for that matter. And yeah, I, I never left. Like uh, high resolution fMRI is kind of the, in my view, the supreme discipline of sequence development, right? The, the, all the big labs are somewhat invested into it. And then most of the big innovations of sequence improvements, I guess over the last decade are coming very often are driving, are driven from fMRI and high resolution fMRI and then kind of falling back to to like more conventional imaging too like seven tests like like advanced uh, yeah reconstruction strategies uh, accelerations methods and all that so so high resolution fMRI is kind of the vibrant interdisciplinary area that I had to be part of it so that's why I ended up here well that's i mean yeah certainly it's the benefit of the field just before I get into talking about MRI a little bit, I just have to mention a personal thing with, with you is that I actually, I actually, you know, obviously you do many things with, with processing and, and, and neuroscience. And that, that's a really nice story about the serendipity of just Googling, you know, neuroscience and brain with getting Bob Turner. <laughs> that's awesome. But one thing actually that struck me is that I remember when we were, when you first came to the NIH, you know, you, you wanted to understand, you know, to, to understand how, uh, I, I guess, how the motor cortex was sampled uh, by MRI. And, and you actually made a, as opposed to some people just looking at pictures and doing, you made a wax model of the motor cortex. So you can actually look at it and feel it and, and manipulate it in your hands. And I thought that was really unique and, and, and interesting and special in some, in, in a really good way. I, you know, that obviously that could be part of your, your training as a, uh, all up to through high school at the, at the Waldorf school. Um, but I thought that was, uh, I don't know if you have any perspective on the advantage. And I think it actually is an advantage in some sense of looking at things in, in, in you know, trying to make it more visceral. So you have a deeper understanding potentially. Um, yeah. I think sometimes we are lost in the detail. We need to get to the kind of core and get an intuitive feeling of, of what we are working with. And the VAX model helped me there a lot with uh, like having non-isotropic voxels aligning it and then just experiencing it and like I was like I come from a um, family of artists so wax is kind of part of my my daily routine like you have blood plus plastic and then like sculpture building equipment around and that's why that was my nowadays you would 3d print it or whatever but uh, yeah yeah but either way I thought it was that was I think there's that's a useful art and skill that still has value um, I think uh, in many ways so, all right. So just to get into now, now to get into MRI a little bit. I, I, and so what, what drew me, what, what actually sucked me into MRI even more uh, when I started, I, uh, you know, my understanding of MRI was sort of like, you know, you know it's an image, a clinical imaging, you, you make MRI images, but 
But I think MRI is, is people don't really fully appreciate how truly unique MRI is in the sense that you have so much control over so many parameters and you can pull out so much different information that we're still understanding to this day. And, and, and so, you know, my sense is that, is that MRI continues to surprise and advance because of the interface of hardware and programming and, you know, obviously interpretation. And, and so what would any of you say has been, you know, in your mind, at least some of the more impactful advances in, in hardware or, or other capabilities of MRI, pulse sequences perhaps, but, but the, you know, it's all, they're all linked in some way. Hardware allows you to do certain pulse sequences, which allows you to do certain studies that you can gain more insight about. What would you say are some of the major milestones in the last, you know, 30 years, let's say, since fMRI began, <laughs> or maybe 40? Uh, for some of, for, for maybe David. <laughs> any, any well, one thing I'm, I might add is, you know, just that it's amazing to see how the technology continues to advance, right? Yes. You know, it's never holding still. And it's interesting to see how, you know, over the decades, you know, first maybe with magnets, you know, and then later with uh, gradient coils uh, and RF coils, you know, the technology seems to co-evolve, right? You know, when the 70s, you know, first appeared, you know, 20 years ago or so. It was before we had, you know, uh, these high performance head gradient coils, before we had uh, parallel imaging and RF coils. And I remember, you know, Larry said to me at some point that, you know, when, when they first installed the 7T at MGH, people said he's never going to be able to do EPI, you know, because the distortions are going to be too severe. But it was before we had parallel imaging, you know, when parallel imaging was developed. So I think you're right that, you know, it's almost like the 7T was a very clear direction, more SNR. You know, and with that additional SNR and, and contrast, there's a lot we could do. But that created new problems, <laughs> which were addressed by, you know, gradient coils or by parallel imaging. And now that we have these technologies, people are pushing it even further, you know, 10.5 Tesla. You know, and I think today, you know, we do have these ingredients that we can kind of pull together, you know, to make the 10.5 Tesla a success. But I think we're going to learn, you know, with this project, you know, um, what other technologies are going to be needed, you know? So I think that the hardware is kind of funny, you, you know, solve one problem and create another, <laughs> you know, and new technologies come on board, you know, in order to address those, in order to reap the full benefits, you know, from these especially higher field strength scanners. So I think that absolutely instrumentation, the fact that it's continuing to evolve, I guess, you know, David will have a few things to say about this too, but uh, yeah, David, what are your thoughts? <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you. I would step further back and say that uh, NMR and MRI is, is really entirely a man-made phenomena. And so, you know, we, we are basically tailoring and changing it to the experiments that we want to do. And, and by pursuing a particular type of phenomena or measuring something, we modify the technology to, to achieve that. Um, that. That was true um, early on. And now, so, you know, I think that layer fMRI is particularly challenging for a number of reasons. Smaller voxels, you need higher signal to noise, higher sensitivity. Uh, you also have very different confounds in the imaging that we don't even have so much in columnar imaging because the, the draining veins are passing through the layers. And as we know that you get a, sort of a, a difficult venous signal that, that obscures this, the neuronal uh, neurovascular coupling signal that you want to see in the superficial layers. So it changes the type of pulse sequences. We move from gradient echo or T2 star imaging affects large vessel diameter contrast to you know, making more favorable techniques that you wouldn't normally ever use, like 3D grace or even vaso seem to be the techniques that overcome this greater specificity you need for layers. So, and at the same time, the higher resolution makes us more sensitive to motion, different types of motion, but I think they're very favorable conditions of looking at the cortex compared to other areas of the brain. So I, I, th I think that, yeah, and it's definitely hardware improvement. It's everything. And you have to have cumulative gains in the hardware, the pulse sequences and everything to, to really advance layer fMRI. You can't, you know, 70, I think, I think uh, layer fMRI came out of the, the larger groups like uh, CMRR, Minnesota and MGH Air Group, John, because you had 7T and you, you know, early on in advanced technology. But I think a lot, as Renzo says, a lot of the pulse sequence advances in techniques are coming from other groups. And um, we have a lot of second generation, if you will, 7T sites that can now contribute. And 
it's just continuing to evolve and advance. Yeah, let's maybe well, let's get let's talk a little bit about the setters. So, I mean, it, it, I sort of was thinking about you know the, the world of layer up and the world of high field, and and there's not that many groups. I mean, it's uh, you know Renzo has his right. uh, list of you know eighty or to a hundred or so seventy scanners, but but even still, among those, there's only about your groups and maybe maybe uh you know the nih maybe glasgow maybe uh you know nijmegen nottingham and a few other groups but maybe why don't you talk a little bit about your group uh each of your groups uh that you have uh as far as what you know what's unique about your group that are you're bringing to the table of layer of mirai uh, in that regard maybe starting with uh writer uh, yeah oh, thanks peter um yeah, actually, we are a group um, where my dream, as I um, said at the beginning, to go to the mesoscopic scale to better understand the neural correlates of the mind at the um, laminar and columnar level. So I'm seeing myself more as a person who pushed my physicist to get more and more resolution, sensitivity, um, and so on. And I remember a lot of talks, uh, also with David, of course, when we met, for example, in Minneapolis or also in Maastricht and other places, to always uh, discuss how can we get, you know, more fine-trained voxels which still provide enough signal to noise. And, and I think it's an impo important point to say for me as a non-physicist um, that it is important for neuroscientists to understand enough of the, of course, we do not, I do not build my calls, although I'm, um, I'm supporting this in various ways um, uh, for high field scanners. But the important point I want to make is to have a good communication between the neuroscientists and the MR physicists I'm tried always to be interface and try to link these two uh, uh, species, so to say, right? And then in some way people develop, like look at Federico de Martino in our lab. Uh, he is both now a physicist and a neuroscientist and comes from engineering, right? And that's because he learned, he went to Minneapolis and learned a lot and, you know, from us more than neuroscience and the questions, he does beautiful lamina FMI and so on. But, but these are the new breed of people who are not just one thing, but there are these interfacing people because they know enough about at least two worlds, I would say, right? Yes. And that's important. And when, when, when we um, wanted to move to, to um, high field imaging in Maastricht, in, in my place, um, uh, we basically um, um, could only convince our um, university by, 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 by showing what good links we had with the established high field centers, especially in Minneapolis. So, so with Camille Lugerville coming over and, and helping us to convince uh, how important it is for bringing neuroscience forward to go with high resolution to sub millimeter resolution, um, that was basically a very strategic and important point. And we did before we had our own 7 and 94T, which is the speciality here. We have um, three scanners in a new center and several clinical others, but three are just, just in parentheses, just for research. Uh, um, at least mainly, and, and, and at least they were originally just for research uh, um, funded. And that I think was a big thing, it was the first in the Netherlands where, where you could do high field imaging for cognitive neuroscience, right? This, this is, I think, was an important step. And I think the speciality uh, at that time was definitely to um, yeah, um, uh, push even beyond 70 and then for, for, for more a user and not so much a core physicist. It was a bit of a risky move. But I can tell you, it was more easy to convince the government, some funding agencies, uh, and people, if you're not saying we want to have in 7T as the others already have, but if you said we go a step further, money flows a little bit faster. So therefore, it was also a strategic move. Now, of course, we are happy that we have not only a wonderful 7T, but also a 940T, uh, which, as, as David knows, of course, Renzo knows, it needs a lot of extra work because it's bare bones basically from Siemens, right? And and therefore um, it is a little bit heavy for a more neuroscience oriented group like we are here. But we get going. We invested in that further, and we hopefully will in the future. And and now we see already the fruits of, of this and do lamina fMRI studies in the context of my human brain project, but also in the context of Elia Formisano's grants and many others. And and the, the work, for example, with with Renzo, but also with Benedict Poser on developing optimized sequences, which we as neuroscientists say we need, if possible, that speed to do connectivity. We need that resolution to resolve laminae and also cortical columns and so on. Uh, that's a constant a dialogue, of course. And, and I think the speciality, I would say, of my lab is that it comes from a cognitive neuroscience uh, um, uh, motivation, which I brought forward first here. 
And then, of course, succeeded in the sense that we have even a non-standard center because it has also 9.4 Tesla, right? So, so let me just ask, uh, before I go on to talking about the other centers really quickly, about the 9.4, um, just the idea of higher field strength. Certainly, it's worth it because you gain signal to noise. But I mean, you know, if you if you, if one, one might push back a little bit and say, well, you only gain nine sevenths more signal to noise, and that will allow you to get a voxel volume that's nine seven smaller <laughs> and is that is that is that all that's in the equation or? i would say um, um i mean the experts are here to to discuss the details better than me but i would say any little bit improvement is important we see that for example in our studies on direction of motion and mt columnar organization there we basically have realized that the 70 we cannot resolve all directions of motion and we move to a simpler paradigm of of axis of motion where you combine opposing directions of motion because they are, which we know from Albright and Newsom in the monkey, because these columns cluster together. So we get a larger, so was something like a hyper column, which we suddenly could see. And David was involved in that study in 2010, 2011, where we showed for the first time these axis of motion in MT, extrastriate cortex. And, and, and therefore it is important that um, you, that was 70 with the strict, but now we hope to see directions of motion at 9.4. That's one of the projects we are moving into. And, and, and therefore I think it is worthwhile. I mean, look at 11.7. I mean, if you st talk to Stan Dehan, who is also like me, driven more from cognitive neuroscience, he also wants to have 500 uh, micron resolution, me too, because then of course you might see orientation columns in V1. Of course, there is the study of, of Minneapolis, which had shown orientation columns in V1. But the point is they used thick slices and had only a tiny straight part of the calcarine. What we want to get layers, which they didn't, we wanted to always have small enough voxels to measure at the same time the columnar direction and the depth direction with the same isovoxel resolution. That was our goal for, uh, when we started our um, uh, endeavor into 7T because then we can go what for cognitive neuroscience is so important, not only in early visual cortex, but go to higher level cortex. And, and therefore, I think pushing that further, even if there are small further uh, improvements, is important. The yeah. final point I want to say is we also have a head gradient 94T. And of course, that gives us a certain certain extra benefits to push it a bit further. Yeah, and and I think your your point that you bring out, I think is a, is a perfect point, is that we're, you know, you're even a little gaining a little bit. There's we're right at this interface of all this information uh, that that's residing at this it's at this spatial scale that that we're just tapping into, and it's sort of like opening up things exponentially as we just go a little bit more. So that's a really good point. I yeah. have a different view. I have a different perspective on this. Okay. Uh, Part of the technology development, and you know, um, you know, I, the seven T was well, even three T was uh, difficult to develop, and there's a lot of technology development. But I think, particularly for uh, layer fMRI, Reiner, just as you said, you you need to bring together the the neuroscientists and the physicists and the MRI scientists and the technology together. What my perspective is that. All, any field strength, particularly 70, is quite good. And there's so many different areas to improve the sensitivity, um, the speed, the signal to noise with new hardware. Um, but to bring it to the neuroscientists is really critical. And if there's only one or two centers that can afford and have these ultra high field scanners and also to maintain them, they're purely um, experimental, that they're constantly having... Uh, issues and problems as as compared to a commercial scanner that can be disseminated. I think in terms of advancing the field, it's better to pick something that isn't super extreme, but very high, and then keep pushing all the different areas of technology. Because if you have one weak link, you don't get the good sensitivity signal to noise. So you need to have better gradients, you need to have receiver arrays, larger arrays, and, and, and it's there are trade-offs at ultra high field, and you know that, and we know that Renzo and I have uh, looked at things too. And you know, you have uh, different echo planar T2 star decay is much faster at ultra high field and distortions are greater. And so you're, you're having trade-offs in the image. So you're not even getting that, that whatever um, nine, you know, 9.4 to seven ratio of sensitivity gain. You, in other areas you do get 
combined gains because if you're looking at bold contrast, the sensitivity of susceptibility goes up as well as the basic, you know, proton density sensitivity. But but we're not using those right now in layer fMRI very much. So it, it's very complicated. And I think I, I I think what you said initially, I really agree with. You have to have all the scientists being able to work together on a scanner. And so I think yeah, I mean, as much as I would love to have a 9.4 or a 10.5 T scanner. Uh, I don't think it's a good investment for the field. Yeah, okay, go on, Reiner. Yeah. I just want to 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 um, say two things to 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 uh, reply. Very good points you make, David. I would first say I'm very pragmatic. I don't care whether your improved 70 or whether uh, 11.7 brings me what I need. I don't care. You are the smart guys. <laughs> Whatever you do to give me 500 isovoxel micron resolution with a decent signal to noise, of course. Yeah. You have me. I come over tomorrow. You have me bought. But of course, I think that higher field strengths and developments also there should be done in parallel to improving, like you rightly say, the 7T. Because at some point you might also find, you know, I didn't like when people said I was starting with a 1.5 Tesla in Frankfurt when I when I did in Wolf Singer's lab, built there the FMI crew. Um, uh, and, and, and now we are at 7T and a little bit higher even. Um, but the point is that uh, the important point is that, you know, with, with these movements, we should be open-minded because there were always people when grants were written for high field scanners, you don't need more than 3T or 1.5 before that. So, so I'm, I'm very pragmatic and would say, yes, the current high field level, the standard ultra high field level 70 should be improved, you're right. But there should also be people who have the chance to try to go even higher. They might have more downsides also, and it I might take longer until they have under the line, under real benefits. But listen, here in the Netherlands, we try to go now to 14 Tesla in an, as a national move. So therefore, we don't know whether it works out, but, but it is, and I heard it from other labs too. But So there is definitely an interest from MR physics people, uh, but also for neuroscience to go beyond 70. I agree. No, yeah. it's certainly, we need to advance in all areas at the same time. It's just very, uh, it's very costly in terms of man hours and development if you, if you just pursue one thing, I mean, uh, Minnesota, I think they got their 10.5 T magnet. And if I'm not mistaken, around 2012, right. and they're only now doing human imaging, beginning to do human imaging. So that's a lot of investment and, and 70 and, and, and gradient technology and RF array technology has all been advancing and is improving um, 70 as well. So, but I don't disagree with your saying basic research is extremely important. But where that is done, is it right for a neuroscience center to get the 11.7 T scanner where they don't have the infrastructure of all the physicists, you know, 100, 100 engineers and physicists to do the work? I, I just, yeah, anyway. Yeah, that infrastructure is critical. And uh, so before we talk, I mean, it actually, I mean, before we talk about MGH, which has, uh, I think, probably one of the best, uh, most extensive infrastructures of, of expertise. I just want to, while you're, while you're mentioning, uh, David, your, uh, you know, what, what's required, why don't you just uh, talk a little bit about, you know, obviously over the years, there's been a lot of uh, uh, excitement over the next gen 70 uh, brain scanner at Berkeley. Could you talk maybe a little bit about what's planned and, and, and why it, how it will improve things? Okay, yeah, thank you for asking. And um, yeah, so I've, I've been sort of a guest at many imaging centers because I've never had a 7T. So I work with Minnesota, MGH and um, Tubingen. I've been there um, on their 9.4T. But the Brain Initiative, when it came out, offered an opportunity to do uh, very uh, daring big things. And so it was like the mouse that roared. Berkeley didn't have any ultra high field group at all, but I was... Uh, uh, am at Berkeley. And um, so I wrote a proposal to develop all aspects of the hardware for 7T to get cumulative gains and improve the scanner. And um, one of the major applications uh, at the, and still is, is layer fMRI for the scanner. And so the scanner, almost every subsystem of the scanner is being developed and improved. And we're very fortunate to collaborate with one of the big uh, manufacturers, uh, Siemens, has had a leading gradient group for many years. Not that GE doesn't have strong uh, development as well, but I'd had a, a relationship with Siemens. So 
Uh, in short, then the scanner, uh, you know, was in three years, two to three years of planning, design with the gradients, the RF system. We did a lot of prototype testing, look at different array, uh, loop diameter sizes, how we get the best signal to noise. We know if we go to higher, uh, larger arrays, our, our parallel imaging uh, spatial sensitivity improves. You're really getting resolution from the array and parallel imaging. So a higher density, larger arrays give you higher acceleration, lower G factor. We, we knew that, but we didn't know about signal to noise. But anyway, so we ended up um, going to 128 channel receiver system. And uh, this is the first at 7T, but also the gradient coil we knew from my experience working on several uh, different sites uh, really had problems with long acquisitions of heating and limited you know, duty cycle effects um, and amplitudes were not sufficient. So um, it turned out the gradient coil was a collaboration between Matthias Davids, who did the simulations of the peripheral nerve stimulation. He was then a graduate student at University of Heidelberg as a physicist, one of the leading physics graduate programs in the world. And Peter Dietz of Siemens, uh, in conjunction, designed this gradient coil testing against the models. And, it, and we can now image, and we are imaging the brain with 900 uh, slew rate, which is extremely high without PNS stimulation. Just, just to emphasize, that's a head gradient coil. It's a local it's a head gradient coil. So the coil can go to very fast switching rates because the coil is not covering the heart as normal body coil. So almost all scanners are limited to a 200 uh, Tesla per meter per second slew rate because you would be shocking the heart, let alone peripheral nerve stimulation. So, but by limiting the coil to just covering the head, you um, free that constraint. And so, but also the coil needed to have, um, well, we need high, we want to do basically echo planar type pulse sequences for neuroimaging, whether they are used as a readout for vaso sequence with 3D EPI or GRACE has short echo trains, and so to get higher resolution in, in echo planar, you need larger pulses. Those read gradient polarity, positive negative polarity need to be either taller or longer. And longer delays the TE and increases distortions and T2 stars. So we needed high amplitude gradient pulses, fast slew rate. So this is an extremely high performance, 200 millitesla per meter gradients and a very, very high slew rate and a larger diameter of 44 centimeters so we can fit the larger arrays, RF arrays, and also parallel transmit we're developing for controlling the SAR and also better homogeneity of flip angle and even doing exotic pulses. So there in the, the, the support system, the patient bed, uh, all had to be changed. Uh, it's, it's really a new scanner and, and everything is prototype and, uh, there are problems with every subsystem that we've had and things need to be rebuilt and redesigned and COVID has caused a large delay. But at, at, over the last month, we've been getting, I guess, arguably the highest resolution echoplanar images that have been achieved with very good, very high signal to noise. But so we so is, this, is this resolution, um, so with your, your high resolution echoplanar, is it, is it uh, single, uh, it's multi-shot or is it 3D or is it... Uh... So we, we've only begun testing with single shot standard gradient echo EPI. We're in collaboration with MGH. Uh, John has sent us his um, dual grappa uh, parallel imaging uh, reconstruction algorithms. It's, it's helped a bit, uh, quite a bit. And, um, but just, just basic test sequences. So gradient echo EPI, we, we find we can achieve uh, 0.5 millimeter in plane single shot without segmentation. With, with arguably very, very good signal to noise. We haven't quantified it, but I, we've done some TSNR measurements and we're at least, you know, two to four times higher uh, TSNR measurements, but only in a very small number of subjects. We and, and there's so many problems right now with the prototype hardware that need to be fixed that we aren't really running optimally. But, and we also can achieve much higher acceleration, but we're not as high as we expect, but I think it's so all it seems that together. And, and all of this technology can be disseminated and put into other scanners. And that's, I think, very critical. Yeah. So the, the 128 channel receiver seem, I mean, there's always these, you know, there's so many trade offs. Uh, and, uh, and right, the 128 channel, obviously, you, you, you get more sensitivity to the surface as the, as the receivers become smaller, but also you, you gain a signal noise everywhere. But, and that actually is an interesting what you're mentioning. Uh, it seems that might be a critical thing. 
and obviously the slew rate, I, I'm still even surprised that you don't suffer from, you know, shoulder simulation or, or things like that, even with the grading coil. And that's, that's really hard yeah. to know. I, I, I'm always been a proponent of local head grading coils. I think that. Right. Um, uh, well, I think that what happened was uh, Matthias Davids had this model and we could see the hotspots. The papers are by, you know, Davids and Wald, senior author. And, you know, you could see the hotspots of, of, threshold for stimulation in the shoulders, the nose, and the face. But the, the wiring, uh, Peter Dietz came up with three layer, very novel, three uh, winding layers that increased, gave an extra degree of freedom in the d coil design. So we could raise the threshold in those areas where you have peripheral nerve stimulation. And therefore, um, we could go to much higher slew rate, faster switching that the hardware could do. With hardware will go to 1100 to 1400 slew rate, but not without the stimulation. And most head grading coils, you know, you're imaging at 400 to 500 slew rate before you get the stimulation. But with the physiologic modeling and the actual design, we could go, we can go much higher. That's remarkable. That's actually great. Um, yeah, I look forward to, I look forward to that. <laughs> That's really exciting uh, as you, as you know, COVID gets over, as you build out your team. But John, uh, really quickly, uh, so MGH obviously has been, you know, pushing the field for a long, long time. And, and you have a, a huge infrastructure. I don't expect to describe it there, but I mean, you do have the seven Tesla scanner and you have the Connectome uh, scanner. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you... You know, talk about that a little bit, and and what what, and obviously, you, you know, the Larry Wald is, has his fingers in all kinds of things, like ultra low field imaging and yes. you know, all kinds of things. So maybe just briefly mention. Yeah, well, yeah. So there's a, I guess there's a lot going on. I mean, I think that, um, yeah. So we actually have the two seven Teslas now. We have the classic. Uh, we have the Terra, which is great. You know, the Connectome scanner is also, you know, another example of a high performance uh, gradient system. In this case, designed for diffusion, has a GMAX of 300 uh, millitons per meter. You know, uh, slew rate's not bad, you know, but it was really designed for kind of high B-value diffusion. That's at three Tesla because, you know, the T2s are you know, quite, quite short at 70, so they decided to put that in 3T. Uh, there's, you know, several uh, tabletop uh, kind of portable low field scanners as well, including uh, Matt Rosen's ultra low field uh, scanning bay. How do you think that, you know, one of the elements that's really enabled uh, the success of the Matina Center is, yeah, like this willingness to invest in instrumentation, you know, willingness to try out new uh, instruments from RF coils to greening coils, you know, and I will echo Reiner. I think that the real key ingredient has been getting all these people into one, you know, under one roof. The instrumentation, you know, experts like Larry Wald, who's always innovating, you know, pulse sequence designers like Cowan Setsenpop, you know, uh, people who are doing analysis like Bruce Special. Having all of these people under the same roof with neuroscientists like Rachu Tutel, I mean, this has been a real recipe. So I just echo what Reiner said. And yeah, so it's nice to have all of these great scanners to, to use. And again, the fact that there's a willingness, you know, to try new things, there's a willingness to try new instruments. I think that's been a big element in the success, especially in the early days of the 7 program. Yeah, credit, I mean, definitely credit to Bruce Rosen for, you know, really, I mean, I did my postdoc there and, and uh, uh, you know, I, more than any other place, at least I, I personally experienced, it's sort of like this just crackles with this energy that and so much expertise. And it's, you know, it's certainly every place has their, has their you know, politics, but I, I really was struck by the fact that under Bruce, it's like, everyone is sort of like, we're all part of this thing. We're all part of this team. Yeah. We're all doing our amazing work on our own, but we also are completely open and want to share ideas. So I think that, that's really an important element. I think that every group should sort of try to keep in mind that to have good collaboration, you have to have sort of this top down. You have, certainly have, you know, Bruce loves to emphasize the bottom up sort of bubbling of these ideas, but you really do need some sort of a top down sort of sense like, hey, you know, no politics, no, just let's just do our thing. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So it's the same way today, you know, and I think it's, you know, a testament to Bruce. I mean, yeah, he, I think, you know, created this environment. It's so open and collaborative. I mean, everyone works together. You know, whenever anybody has an idea, it's just infectious. I think you're right. A lot of creativity. And I think, yeah, we owe a lot of that uh, to Bruce. And so I agree. It was not just didn't come up uh, naturally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, no, I absolutely agree. One, one quick question about your, your Connectome scanner. We're not going to talk yeah. too much about it, but just you mentioned 300 millitests. I mean, that's not too much greater than what's uh, proposed at what's sure. at Berkeley, but you know, yeah. but you do have a whole body design. So is there, is there, was there a rationale for, I mean, it seems like any of these where you're pushing the envelope, uh, it seems it makes more sense to go, if you just care about the brain, obviously, if you care about the rest of the body, then, then it's something else. But if you care about the brain, why not just have all these centers go to 
had great equals. Oh, well, yeah, no, I would agree. You know, and I think that, you know, we also, I would say, you know, we owe a lot to David. I think the fact that he pushed this project forward, you know, on the one hand, you know, David's going to get some amazing images very soon, but the fact that he has sort of, you know, uh, pushed the vendors to revisit this technology, I think it's amazing to see that, you know, Siemens were building amazing head grading coils, you know, uh, 15 years ago, like the Allegra system, for example, was a fantastic, you know, kind of ahead of his time. I think David, you know, really pushed, you know, Siemens to think about this sort of next generation head grading coil. So I agree with you, uh, Peter. I mean, I think it's true that maybe not every site, you know, just wants to focus on brain, you know, so that might be one consideration, but I fully agree. I think that, you know, there's some challenges with these head grading coil designs, but the fact is for many years, you know, they were starting to be de decommissioned. Uh, in, in our seven Tesla, we had head grading coils for many years. You know, a lot of my work was on the head gradient system, but it was removed in favor of kind of a more kind of clinically friendly uh, body coil. Uh, but I think that, you know, we're seeing that both at Siemens, uh, GE and Philips as well, you know, there's a new, there's a kind of renaissance of these head gradient coils. And I'm really happy to see it because as David has shown, I mean, and we've, you know, looked at these peripheral nerve stimulation models from, you know, the, we call it the fine Bergatron gradient because it's uh, David's uh, brainchild. It's amazing. It's shocking to see, <laughs> you know, we had, we thought we'd be peripheral nerve stimulation limited, but yeah. we're not, you know, so it, it, you know, that was the goal, of course, and it seems to have worked. Um, and so the fact that, you know, David's system has sort of removed this constraint is huge. Uh, I, I, I can't bear any more of this uh, kind of identification with it. Um, <laughs> reminds me of an elementary school. Where, um, you know, I was called the Feinberger, but um, so, but more important, let me just comment, um, you know, MGH group, there's no question, they are an extremely innovative group and it's their culture. And I don't know where it came from, whether it's Bruce or whether it's MIT and getting these young, uh, really, you know, highly talented and motivated postdocs and grad students, but they're extremely innovative. And then I think that, you know, that's this whole field is being driven by innovation and, and you know, Renzo Huber has been extremely innovative in the pulse sequence development. And, and the other thing is that to really move forward in, in MRI, you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to be able to do many different aspects of the experiment to move it forward. And so that often is a physicist like Renzo or somebody who can do many different things uh, that can uh, move it forward. Um, so that you see that in the groups, they have their multi, talented and, and in the individuals. Um, and one comment about the gradients, the connectome gradient, yeah, it's a 300 millitesla amplitude, but it's covering the heart. So it's limited to a 200 slew rate, something like 250, three, is that? And, and it's a three Tesla. <laughs> and so the difference between this new gradient coil is that it's operating at seven Tesla where you have much higher signal to noise and diffusion imaging is, is a signal amplitude contrast mechanism. So if you're at higher field, you have higher sensitivity to diffusion. So we don't know for diffusion imaging if our new 70 scanner with 200 uh, might be at least as good at performing as the 300 or, or more. We just don't know. And it may be that people can have all in one diffusion and fMRI very high performance at 70 to do very broad studies. Um, and so I just want to get that out that the technology is, is really not fully defined yet. And what I'd say, David, is we did some back of the envelope calculations and I think you're right. You know, so yeah, so the connectome, you, you, it, there are limits. I think we went up to 273, but I think you're right. We did some calculations, not only because of the gradient strength that the Feinberger John gradient provides, but because of the slew rate as well, getting those faster EPI readouts. Yeah. I do think that your system will have better diffusion at 70. Okay, yeah, but then there's multiple ways to, to, to do things. And I, I'd like Renzo, I mean, I, I'm not leading this discussion, but I yeah. mean, Renzo is pursuing uh, segmentation techniques now. So you don't need such um, the, the same gradient performance if you can use multiple shots. And uh, you right. know, I think this is really yeah. important. Yeah. Like we talked a lot about uh, the kind of game, the like game of, of the best hardware there is and, and, and of the, these leading centers. But I think like, I'm, I'm trying to curate kind of all the papers that are coming out in the field and like in organizing these virtual layer dinners, I'm, I'm having a list of all the, the active protagonists doing layer dependent fMRI. And, and if you look at the kind of field um, cross section, you see that most of the neuroscience application studies are 
still using a body gradient with a 32 channel Nova coil and like the shim design from the 90s. So even though there's all this exciting development there, um, I think the, the, the sequence in innovations are, are kind of maybe faster or, 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 or just dominating the field right now. And, and I think segmentation is this one thing, the, the, the advancements in the KIP sampling, which just like gets rid of, of noise amplification, something that we previously called like thermal noise and didn't think that we could get rid of it. It's just kind of diminished or these advanced um, Grupper reference acquisition scheme almost for free, you just get a gain. So I think um, that there's um, a lot of um, like software improvements that can kind of democratize or, or um, make all these like new developments more, more available to, to a very wide community. And layer dependent fMRI is getting a lot of attention of the neuroscientists. So I think we need to worry about that a lot. Yeah. So yeah, so I think actually, and, and, and you know, there's been a little bit of uh, uh, just uh, quickly along the lines of diffusion imaging. I mean, obviously seven Tesla T2 stars and T2s get a little bit shorter, but going to have faster slew rate. So you can image them earlier. I think the ultimate is, is, is to, you know, seven Tesla's a net gain. I think with the with the gradient coil, definitely. Yeah. So I think this is so far a great discussion. We're barely getting started here. <laughs> Why don't we shift gears a little bit uh, to talk about uh, the contrast? You know, the big part of layer fMRI. That's even it's been something that's prevalent in all of MRI uh, fMRI for a long time. Is you know big vein effects, and whatever, and you know especially it becomes what you know. With, with layer fMRI, this particular problem becomes all the more acute because it's really critical to know what you're looking at in order to interpret the, the effects. And way back in 2010, actually, John had one of the first papers on talking about layer fMRI with uh, imposing the an M and, and showing that it's better resolved at lower layers because there's less peel vessel effects, essentially. I, I thought to myself, it'd be kind of cool to actually, but it wasn't really questioning, you know, what the layer functions were. It'd be kind of cool to actually have, uh, you know, different patterns for out output versus input. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, but but regardless of that, Great Echo has been used. Um, Spin Echo, Renzo has been pioneering Vaso, which has been uh, a, a nice trade-off in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And I'm still, and, and here we have David here on, uh, Talking about uh, he he invented developed three uh, developed grays uh, back in 1995 uh, for many different purposes and this purpose has been compares well in terms of also coverage and it also seems like it doesn't suffer from the same effects that typical echo planar spin echo does in the sense that you have a long readout window have T2 star effects but also and I'm still trying to get my head around why there's less like intervascular effects with, with grace potentially, why, why it works uh, as well as it can. So feel free to talk about the, the contrast mechanisms. So I, I will talk about grace after Renzo talks about phaso. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Go ahead, okay. Renzo. <laughs> and I think like that the contrast, that there are methods, right? There are, there are means to an end. And, and I'm not sure if it, if it's really the question that I should ask myself, like, um, what is the difference of the different methods? It, because, like, we are, ultimately we, we are interested in, in, like, what we are answering with that. And I invested a lot of my, like, um, like research in, in method characterization, comparison studies, and I think the entire field was dominated by the discussion. And I'm not sure if that was um, distracting us uh, a bit because it's, how should I say, um, like, I, I like this metaphor of the vehicles. You have a bike and a ship and then both can get you from A to B. And if you're very skilled and, and have training on bikes, then maybe even a bike gets you around the lake faster than a ship. And then, and, and, and uh, um, they, they give you different uh, views. Maybe I, I like the perspective of the, the young students, the millennials. They are, they, for them, the kind of ter like concept of intellectual property is, it's not that like internalized. They don't care much about who invented what. And they know that the time when you could become rich by inventing a new sequence has long passed. So they 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 kind of more immune to this competitive method comparison. So I think they they see it more as a, a set of control methods. Like in, in neuroscience, and maybe Reiner can correct me, you when you design a study, you have your main task, right? And then you have a lot of control conditions to a control for attention, low level features. And sometimes you spend more time on these control tasks. Similarly for the analysis, you have your main analysis and all these control analysis. And then they think of the methods also as 
you have this method and whatever method you, you choose, maybe gradient echo, grace, vaso, it has these certain features and then you have maybe a control method and to, to see if, if that shortcoming of that method is can be explained or whatever. So I, I think of it as a nice set of, of like, uh, a fleet of vehicles at, uh, with different methods. And um, I, I don't want to be distracted by, by um, listing advantages of VASO over, over other methods. That's uh. very dramatic, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it is, it is a trade-off space. I mean, we're, and that's the whole point I want to bring across is that we're still understanding the nature of the contrast and each sequence has their trade-off in coverage, speed, yeah. time efficiency, whatnot and and so where i mean and you're trying to find an optimal spot in that space depending on your question of course um, like all of mri it's all moving target all the techniques are advancing at the same time and i think the main thing that as i alluded to earlier that differentiates in terms of specificity for layer and i i would like you know i think john could do the best at uh, discussing this is the the draining the veins that are draining through the cortex and they have a very different contrast mechanism and they they are problematic oftentimes for looking at relative changes in signal between different layers if you just want to look at the neurovascular small vessel sensitivity because the layer the veins have a, a different distribution and maybe john can talk about that i'm i'm avoiding talking about the tech Technolo technique differences, and, <laughs> and I will talk about it if you really. Okay. I'm just curious about. I'm, I'm really. I, I'd love to talk. Yeah. Anyway, go on, John. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's lots to say. I mean, I'll try to keep it uh, short. But I guess what I would say is that yeah, we're really pushing the envelope here in, in laminar fMRI, and you know, we're really asking some fundamental questions about how do we relate these fMRI signals to neural activity. And this is important for laminar fMRI, it's important for columnar fMRI, it's important for you know, all fMRI. This is sort of like the biggest problem, I think, with fMRI is that is how do we relate these blood flow and oxygenation signals to neural activity? And so it's just becoming sort of more and more kind of focused with laminar fMRI. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think Renzo is absolutely right. You know, I mean, on the one hand, you know, there's certain techniques that we know aren't very good, but we understand them very well, <laughs> you know, and they can serve as the controls to compare against. Uh, I think it's also true that what I would love to see is, you know, the any researcher has access to all of these methods, you know, and just pick the right tool for the job, you know, and, but I think it's still true, as you were saying, Peter, that we're still kind of understanding these contrast mechanisms, you know, there's still, uh, you know, uh, grace is uh, pretty amazing, right, you know, it, it provides, you know, very, you know, very high specificity, and it's still a little bit un unclear to me, I think, you know, yeah. why that is, you know, yeah. and, and same with Vaso, Vaso is remarkable, you know, it's, 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 it seems incredibly accurate. You know, I think there's still some questions, you know, I think that remain in, in terms of like trying to understand that, uh, that contrast. And so what I would say is maybe right now we're in this sort of regime where people do want to acquire their 3D grace with gradient echo or, you know, vaso, or it doesn't matter, you know, pick your favorite method as a control and compare it against you know, the new method. It's because we're still learning and we're still trying to understand how these contrast mechanisms might generalize. Um, as you said, Peter, yeah, there's a lot of like practical trade-offs in terms of sensitivity and coverage. Yeah, we're in kind of an interesting time right now, you know, that we have so many pulse sequences to choose from. And still, like, you know, I think that maybe with the exception, I don't know, it's not like gradient echo bold is completely understood, but it's, you know, I think probably the best, you know, understood. Yeah, I think that there's still, you know, we're still kind of understand, you know, how well the, you know, how well we understand these contrast mechanisms and and like how well our understanding is generalized to different you know, brain regions. And, and it, right, and it does seem also, even with bold, even with standard yeah. green echo bold, that you know, there's, there's methods of, of trying to calibrate um, across yeah. the region. So yeah, uh, Ryder, you. I just want to stress the point that, um, you know, it's very satisfying if you can use different sequences and find more or less the same results in neuroscience. Yeah. My, when we started like in uh, 10 years ago, a bit, bit longer, also with David as a collaborator at Minneapolis, uh, um, started to, to look for um, the um, um, columnar organization of the RMT in the human. Um, uh, we compared in that first paper already gradient echo and grace. And we followed up with a series of papers with Federico, the main, main, main lead, to really always compare so that you really see what you get yes. with the two. And of course, you get completely different laminar profiles due to the points 
of the vascular uh, training veins we have uh, alluded to earlier. But what I want to say is we recently repeated that old study, 10 years old, with Vaso here in Maastricht, with the help of Renzo, and found more or less exactly the same results cool. and wonderful laminar profiles and, and, and tuning curves across uh, uh, space. So, so for me as a neuroscientist, although I want to do somewhat cooler experiments, and hopefully we do, but it's also in this reproducibility crisis so rewarding. If you have shown it this gradient echo, you have shown it this grace, you have shown it now this basal, the same thing. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important to have kind of a crown truth neuroscience, maybe not a, a crown truth method that you use kind of to calibrate your bold or whatever, but to have kind of the 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 MGHM or the, the, the double peak in a motor call or these like um, orientation columns, like any kind of brain focused ground truth is, I think, way more usable and generalizable as, as kind of a, a method as ground truth. But that's yeah. a good point which you, which you stress, uh, Renzo, because there's also a, a, a very um, important generalization aspect because it's, it's really the goal of neuroscientists to go beyond always showing we get the same in neuroscience as expected from the animal because ultimately we want to go further than that, right? So my, my question always is, When can we say, and of course there are studies uh, which do that already, I'm just a bit polemic now, but at some point we want to say this new finding is not just showing what you know from the animal, but it's in a new area, it's a new phenomenon which you just trust because we now know that we can trust that, that MRI stuff, you know? So I think that is still always difficult, as you all know from Refuse, as long as you can show it replicates what you know already from the monkey, it's you can publish. But if you claims to have seen something really new, it's not easy to get published, right? Because exactly. people then say, oh, all your fancy methods, maybe there's something wrong, right? Exactly. So I, I'd like to comment on this. Um, thinking about the field in general, I think a uh, layer fMRI is extremely valuable for neuroscience and is going to advance not just neuroscience, but also uh, medical applications. But the, the reason is that it's just like high energy physics. You have theories, but you have to get experimental data to prove or disprove the theory. And the, the, the fMRI is giving us um, data, it's giving us, and it can be used to support theories or disprove theories. We, we, we're sort of bootstrapping our way into understanding how the brain works. And clearly being able to get in vivo experiments in the human brain with fMRI is extremely powerful. So this really attracts me to this field and why I want to contribute to it rather than develop uh, you know, a new, new clinical MRI. Because I really think that, that it, it's, of course it's difficult and complicated. I think we will refine our questions and be able to do additional experiments. Let, let me ask about, pursue that, that line right there. So. Uh, certainly visual cortex we have from electrophysiology studies, you know, a good understanding of, you know, generally, I mean, of what output and input, uh, you know, activity is and where it should be located. Uh, motor cortex, to some degree, we have that as well. And, and you know, Reiner actually recently wrote a paper in Neuroimage on benchmarking laminar fMRI sort of with spiking and synaptic activity during top-down and bottom-up processing. And, and he made this interesting suggestion that maybe this organization pattern, I mean, it all hinges on this, is that this pattern, you know, the idea that input and output patterns with upper and lower layers seems like it needs to be everywhere in the brain for us to best interpret layer activity the rest in the rest of the brain. Otherwise, we'll need to have some electric. I always worry that, oh, you know, you might have uh, activity in prefrontal cortex or in parietal area that somebody will say, well, you don't know if what the input and output layers are for this. Uh, you, you, we need to wait for the, the monkey studies uh, to come out. Do we need to, or can we do what I'm, what I was very hopeful about potentially is that we can do, you know, in vivo uh, with MRI uh, uh, histology and, and sort of characterize the cell types uh, throughout the brain to know what output and input might be. I mean, is that a big problem? Do you see that as a, as a, a barrier or do you see that as something that is, could be generalized as Reiner suggests, um, or that could be mappable potentially with MRI uh, using high resolution structure, quantitative structure. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it seems like, you know, what I would say is you know, to the first part, you know, how much is this sort of general kind of pattern kind of replicated across the brain? There's already some evidence to show that it's not. I mean, there's some interesting work from Carl Friston that shows that sort of different cortical types, you know, might have sort of different patterns of inputs and outputs, like a granular versus granular cortices, you know, may exhibit. So, so that's not bad, right? If we can kind of categorize, maybe there's a few types that we can kind of exploit. 
but I like the idea of you know, can we leverage the MRI data, you know, to try to understand, you know, which layers might be inputs or outputs. Yeah, is there some sort of mapping between subtle architectonics, you know, mild architectonics, and you know, the functional roles of layers? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that there is. I mean, I think that'd be awesome. I think you know, you think you're right too that, you know, because a lot of these definitions are based on connectivity. You know, maybe connectivity is the right way, you know, kind of uh, cortical laminar specific connectivity might be a nice way to kind of map these things out. There's another advantage of MR, maybe, you know, um, a lot of the information that we have about these patterns of connections are from invasive uh, tracer studies, you know, which are very challenging to perform. We have very limited information really about, you know, the, exactly how these patterns are laid out. And so, yeah, maybe in the future, if, if MR could non-invasively sort of map these pathways, I think that'd be really valuable. But I want to sort of embrace the complexity of the brain, too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's true that uh, <laughs> even these sort of hierarchical views of, you know, cortical areas that were kind of implicit in, in our definitions of, you know, feed, what's feed forward and what's feedback, you know, those are kind of melting away. So, yeah, so on the one hand, it'd be great to have, you know, a simplistic model to try to you know, predict, you know, patterns across different cortical areas. But but I think we also have to kind of embrace the complexity uh, of the patterns. And But I like your idea, you know, if there's some, if there's some other kind of, uh, you know, micro-architectonic feature that could be predictive of the layers, you know, role, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a great, it's great idea. Certainly, you know, looking at uh, myelination in different uh, sub-areas of the cortex, is one thing um, Bob Turner has uh, pushed this concept and you know with the higher resolution imaging that'll be useful and I think you know the diffusion imaging the fiber track imaging it's getting down Kellen Setsenpoff is pushing it down to mm -hmm. 0.65 millimeter isotropic imaging and it's looking in the cortex so mm -hmm. I think that you know just like with um, clinical radiological imaging we, we we make a diagnosis with multiple different types of images image contrast to subcategorize what Mm -hmm. the process will be. I mean, we will use different MRI contrasts to look at the organization of the brain and subcategorize even diseases. But um, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, I, I believe that, I believe that there's a difference between, you know, highly repetitively used sensory cortex areas like auditory, visual, where you might have very strong evolutionary drive to have um, columnar organization for very efficient. And, but, but other areas of the brain, it's not to say that there isn't some sort of generalizable con, uh, concepts or ways in which input and output layers might be organized because it, it's an organ, you know, it, it, yes, it's special, but it is, it's going to evolve and have generalizable, uh, maybe not canonical, but I think as we, over the years, over the decades, as we, we use the fMRI to, to study it and can separate different areas, I think there will be generalizable um, concepts. And I think, Peter, you're right. I think, I think this is something we need to look at and look for. Like we need to pick a model that, that matches our like, spatial scale that, that we are looking at. And of course, like a conventional resolution would collapse all the, the layers into one and assume that like all the layers are doing the same thing within across cortical depths. No, of course not. So now we have this additional dimension of to see kind of subsample them, maybe two, maybe three, maybe six layers. And of course they, they have different features that are kind of common across areas. Like layer four does layer four things, otherwise it wouldn't be layer four. And I think the big challenge of the the kind of um of the, the zeroth order like complexity of the model is to and um, like, for example, the area difference of the thickness of layer four and the, the position of layer four, that needs to be calibrated. And there we benefit a lot from what David uh, suggested that was um, proposed from, from uh, Robert Turner, namely the kind of a uh, three-step calibration approach that you have ex vivo data, you, you do very high resolution structural MRI, then slice it up to histology. So you look for landmarks that match the histology to um, ex vivo structural imaging. You can refer that directly to in vivo structural imaging, which can be referred to layers, which we did in, in for example, the associative area paper with, with Emily Finn. Like you, you kind of need the, the depth and thickness calibration of the layers. Still, of course, there is this kind of higher order um, simplicity uh, still that not all the neurons within layer four always do the same things, right? So, so, but that's not the spatial scale that we can worry about at that moment. So I think the kind of canonical si um, microcircuit has canonical in its name. So, so we, we, we can, like there is some canonical, some similarity that we can harvest and everything that's not captured there is not our spatial scale. No. We're talking about histological imaging and, and structural imaging. 
But we're now at a resolution in human imaging where we can bridge to animal studies of circuitry and we can use that information as well. So it really is, if you will, uh, one of the goals of the Brain Initiative to bridge multiple scales of neuroscience and we can do studies in human, relate them to um, you know, calcium imaging studies in animals and this uh, we could never do before with, you know, blobology fMRI. And Ryder, you, you wanted to say something too? I mean, I, I, that's exactly oh, like looking at your paper too. I mean, r- looking at Ryder's paper, I mean, there was 2-deoxyglucose measures that would like looked beautiful, like layer activity and combined like, using MRI to, to confirm that or uh, using that to confirm the MRI studies is, was just amazing. Um, so yeah, so Ryder, you-, you, you I, I, I wanted to make a point similar to, to Renzo's actually, but I want to, uh, make it also a little bit as a, as a question to, to, to you guys. Namely, I see what you can see if you compare post-mortem and in vivo imaging, right? You see in post-mortem where, for example, here in, in our institute, Alad Rupruk puts in the 9-4 Tesla, by the way, a post-mortem brain tissue over the weekend or so, right? And what he then shows is so incredible. It goes towards this uh, level of imaging you, you refer to. But the problem is, and that's the question, I mean, we see also even in vivo at 7T in B1, the stria of Genari. So we see there's some microstructure, right? We see the middle layer, layer four. The problem is um, uh, that in, in vivo, if you want to do this in, in vivo, then of course you have motion, you have the pumping brain, the blood is going. And I think more that that will be the limitation because you're averaging over the weekend, you cannot do with a living human. So therefore, my so I'm not so optimistic then you could, can, that you can go to microscopic imaging, at least not in vivo, not so much because MRI might not allow it, but because we are living individuals and, and move and live, and that might limit ultimately what we can do in vivo. It's yeah. absolutely correct. That is a limitation of this mesoscale fMRI as we're getting to the scale where these small cardiovascular driven motions and respiratory motions and changes in susceptibility in the brain due to respiration are really beginning to be uh, confounds and so absolutely correct. And also we cannot image for extended periods of time in vivo like we can for histology, yeah. Yeah, and so so we're just about to get into processing, but um, very quickly, uh, so maybe though with the histology, you could do a excise brain you just have to do it once. I mean, let's say you get all the information. Um, hopefully, maybe it would map in. Uh, it would generalize, but to some degree, obviously, variations across subjects. But it would be nice to be able to, if that really had information about what the layers were doing. It seems like if you had made a nice atlas of that with, with MRI, who knows? Um, yeah, yeah, there's just one piece that I wish that we could get to nowadays. And that is, you know, we have a lot of techniques that are sensitive to iron and, and, and myelin. You know, we're kind of missing techniques that are sensitive to differences in cytoarchitectonics, yes. you know, which really were the basis of a lot of these area definitions. Yeah. Now, it seems like there's some cool work in the microstructural imaging, mostly diffusion based techniques that are starting to get at cytoarchitectonics. You know, I think that'd be a very exciting kind of uh, missing piece that if we could fill that in, you know, in vivo uh, or even ex vivo. Um, you know, still some challenges there. I think that would be, you know, really exciting, you know, and may help us to get to that point of being able to infer from the anatomy, get some sense for what the roles of the layers might be. Yes. Well, susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, diffusion imaging aside, uh, is really sh- beginning to show the, the layer uh, architecture very well. Um, Chen Lei Lu at Berkeley is doing a lot of work on this. And so I think it, MRI, there are multiple techniques that are going to be. Yeah, I just, I'm talking about specificity, you know, in terms of, yes, yeah, SWI is great at looking at differences in myelin, you know, but a lot of the layers are sort of defined by, you know, the differences in kind of cell density, cell size. And if we could get that, it's complementary to the myelin, but if we could get that information as well, I think that'd give us, you know, a lot more insights into potentially the roles of the layers. Yeah, no, no definitely. The susceptibility tensor imaging is beginning to show those, not, not just, yeah, no, absolutely. Mm-mm. Well, that's exciting. I mean, sort of an open-ended sort of uh, look at, you know, once again, MRI has more potential that is probably untapped in terms of this. Uh, so just going into processing and motion and limits, re- very uh, just to s- start this really quickly. Uh, so I remember John's one of John's first papers, uh, or or even well, I guess it was an ISM web abstract for a long time, and it eventually worked its way. It was the first time you actually put uh, layer connectivity or layer interaction to a matrix form, and 
uh, which was really useful. And and certainly this is something I've been talking to Renzo a lot about and how to, and Renzo has been developing this, you know, this whole layer processing pipeline. But if you're to do that, that's, let's say you want to do that the whole brain, whole brain uh, fMRI connectivity. It's huge. <laughs> how do you make sense of that? You must need some either machine learning or, yeah. or, or it's just a massive, massive amount of data that I can't even begin to, have a, I mean, I can begin, but I mean, you can't really have a sense of how it's gonna, how it's gonna play out. How are we gonna finally, if we have whole brain? Well, this actually, I love this question because it kind of got, harkens back to the last one, and that is, you know, how do we establish, you know, how do we establish what the patterns of connectivity are, and you know, are there priors? You know, is there prior information from an adder that we can use to kind of build in some ground truth? Another strategy is to measure it. Right, you know, let's do you know, like what Renzo has been doing, you know, sort of categorize and observe, like, let's look at the patterns, you know, let's see yeah. what, you know, what similarity we see in the fMRI data, yes. you know, let, let the data tell us, you know, what the patterns are. I think that's a really powerful, you know, powerful approach. Um, and then, as you were saying, I think Renzo's already shown like some, I should let Renzo describe it, you know, some clustering <laughs> of the patterns to try to get a sense for how similar they are. I think this is a terrific approach, you know, rather than having necessarily prior information, just make the measurement and let the data tell just us. Make a model, yeah. make a measurement, and then see our patterns and sort of iterate from there in, in some degree. But Ryder, you want to say something? Uh, I'm not afraid of all that data. Give no, it no, I, it's just over. It's just big. I'm not afraid to say I'm so grateful <laughs> that, that we have Renzo here who helps a lot to, to make Basil uh, uh, apl applicable for, for large parts of the brain. I mean, this is a wonderful development because when we started with Grace, one limitation was we had a so tiny slab, which made neuroscience and connectivity a little bit more to other regions basically impossible. So now we go into studying uh, laminar connectivity um, 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 uh, using more, more large scale measurements, which are not great in echo, but which are really uh, uh, basal. So that, that's great. That's, that's really great. But I want to also say that um, if you study the um, uh, connectivity, um, uh, of course, one thing which helps, which we should not forget, is behavior. Because you, you should can look at your patterns, yes, and, and in resting state, you do that. And you can only do that usually. But the neuroscientists do also task FMI. And I think if you have a lots of pattern and vary conditions in a careful manner, that's my job, so to say, to devise experiments and having these controls, which are not only to exclude artifacts, but they're also to, you know, interpret the tasks you do and, and what aspect this part of the brain is playing in that task, right? That's all interactive, but there are specialists which communicate, right? And I think then give me these patterns. And I think with the task, we simplify the, the, the search space, right? Because we delayed it to behavior. And I think that's an important point I want to make to that question. That's a really good point. I mean, uh, right, it's a ton of data, but you can actually potentially search, simplify the search space based on the task, based on the behavior, yeah. If, if I could comment on this uh, yeah. question or issue is that, um, you know, in the Human Connectome Project, we use uh, resting state data. And um, one of the very uh, uh, frustrating things, or not frustrating, but uh, lacking things, we're looking simply at correlation of when the signal is occurring. And, you know, uh, we, we were able to map out um, at much higher detail the different areas of the brain, but we're not really seeing what area is, is uh, uh, active before another area? What is causality in the brain and the circuitry? You don't get that from just simple correlation. I think that's what the, the layer fMRI, I, I may be stating the obvious, but some people maybe don't know this, but by looking at uh, activity in different layers and we can somehow infer the uh, directionality of information in the brain. You know, what is an area is being activated uh, at the same time another area is not. We can see, we, we overcome the, the limitation of bold fMRI where there's this long one and a half second time delay and, and very complex, cannot do Granger causality very well, except in a very crude way. But this could allow us to look at organization of how the hierarchy of the brain is interacting with layer fMRI that we cannot do with resting state. And I think that's obvious to many people, but it has to be said. And actually, I'm glad you said that because we're, we're it's so obvious to all of us that we that, that, that point wasn't actually brought out that this is opens up the entire field of MRI, in my in fMRI, in my opinion, that getting directionality, giving, getting output versus input information and being able to infer that informs connectivity models, you know, uh, uh, it gives much richer information, even potential clinical biomarkers that might be otherwise uh, not observed. 
now. Yeah. And, and the, the, this is the problem with grace, is that grace is an inner volume. It's a zoomed imaging method. So it's restricting the field of view and trading it off for spatial resolution. It's great if you want to look at columns or this particular area. But to cover the whole brain, uh, it, it, it cannot cover the whole brain. Certainly with the new scanner, new technology, we can use a much larger field of view with low flip angle. Uh, we'll have maybe, I, th I think on the order of maybe 20 times larger volume coverage than we did in these early experiments. But to do whole brain imaging, you need something that is efficient, you know, with low flip angle, Ernst angle can cover a large area. And I really think that if, if we're constrained to mitigating the confound of the Venus uh, issue, if we, if we cannot come up with models to filter that out in post data processing modeling, we, we want to do it in the acquisition of data, then we're left with techniques that el eliminate that. And I think VASO, which is CBV, is pretty immune, or at least on the current level, and the GRACE that is largely T2-weighted, not so much T2 star, a large vessel-weighted, are two methods, but the VASO is going to give us the whole brain. So uh, I personally am very much want to pursue the VASO whole brain imaging uh, on our new scanner. I think that's very important at, at a priority over the, the GRACE imaging. So that's great. I mean, I think that there's several techniques that, that might, I mean, there's also... Uh, you know, there's a Dante-based sequence that looks at old and and uh, uh, and also perfusion potentially simultaneously. There's similar spatial specificities for whole brain as well. So now, now, okay. So now the question of okay, it's a ton of data, but and we're very good ideas and how to go about it. I've often thought about how do you how do you average across subjects uh, with with this data? Did, you know, you can't rely on the old-fashioned uh, just do spatial normalization and, and average. Um, and what Renzo and other people have done is take small segments and just segment out that one part of cortex and then average across subjects. That seems like it's somewhat uh, limited in terms of how far it can go. What, any thoughts about how you can actually, um, I mean, there's there's hyper scanning, uh, hyper, hyper alignment, uh, Jim Haxby's concept. Any ideas and how, or else are we just going to get inferences about single subjects, deep imaging and generalize from there, or can we? compare across subjects in any meaningful way? What's the best way of doing that? I think Emily Finn in her recent current, um, the, the current issues in um, neurobiology or progress in neurobiology paper um, she, uh, kind of laid out the, the um, logistics of those kind of analysis a bit um, kind of thinking of, of looking across participants and individual differences just in the layer space. So kind of you extract the layer profiles, for example, during movie watching in each area, and then you pick one subject and then to make a seed analysis and then play around with that. And this is uh, also a bit what, what we use to kind of as a, as a test bed for, for like whole brain imaging to see which area works to kind of take uh, the movie tra traces from a low resolution data set like the HCP and then correlate it, which is kind of an intersubject correlation, but it's more kind of, um, letting the data speak by itself, like what Jonathan uh, mentioned, which is, I think, a lot of fun in the field right now to kind of see what you see and, and see what works and doesn't work. But like this is a podcast of HPM. And, and I, th I'm, I'm, I think we, we have a long way to go to kind of fit within the um, HPM community and new standards there. Like when I, I tell them what I do there and then like, let, let just do a pick a seed and see what you get. And then they say, well, you're on a fishing expedition and they don't mean it as a compliment, right? They, it, it, I think we need to um, kind of have like good strategies to, 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 and, and models to, to like have these like intersubject correlations or, or averages um, combine, combining directly in the column layer space which only works on an area by area level because that's the only kind of um, nice um, parcel border um, definitions that, that works very well across participants. Well, I mean, it's interesting actually using that analysis potentially, I mean, the whole problem is right, as as you get the finer fire scale structure, there's more variability, it becomes more random, like columns seem random to some degree. And and so, and there might be a principle of, of brain organization that comes out of that. Is that, is that, you know, the finer you get, the more, it, the more random it becomes by other forces sort of guiding the structure. So it's a tough, it's a tough problem. So you're, once again, the answer is sort of like this iteration between exploring versus having a, you know, you, nobody has a, a clear definitive answer, it seems. So. I but what, what, what David said earlier also, the, that you decide questions, you have this deductive approach to science, 
There's, of course, the complementary inductive approach. And, and we need to be open-minded and say, let's be surprised how the structure is and how consistent it is across subjects, right? Yes. I think this should be part of the research question, not to force something to be similar, but mm -hmm. to really try to understand why it is like this in this person and like that in this person. Because I think then we might get a deeper understanding and there might be things which are out of our control, which make some alignment, say, within MT that you get the topography there of columns aligned across uh, subjects in the same way. I'm not sure whether this is meaningful because at the end, what I want is, are the tuning curves like like for this motion different columns than for this motion, right? That you that you get a differential aspect. If that is similar, similar tuning curves and similar features uh, uh, and, and laminar profiles in this in different subjects, then I would conclude it, it is similar, and you can average the tuning curves, for example, across subjects. Of course, I would be also open to try to align the topography of one subject and rotate it and try to see whether I can match it to the other, maybe with some form of hyper alignment. Of course, that would be also very cool, but I think that is something on top. I mean, we can average the summary values, summary statistics, whatever we want and find interesting for a certain question. So there is not a problem of generalizing across subject. What you, you ask is probably more, uh, is there the same mesoscopic structure across subjects? And, and that is an, what my, so I had seen many subjects uh, with, 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 with mesoscopic FMI. And my feeling is it is almost like a fingerprint. Like if you look in regions like FFA, MT and so on, you see that it's so different across subjects, but the functions as far as we can um, um, reveal them seem to be more or less the same, right? So therefore at some level you can generalize and others might be quite idiosyncratic. All right, that's a, that's a great way of uh, summarizing that. I mean, I, I think that you're exactly right. I think that we have to be more, right, back off a little bit from our, you know, imposing these models and sort of let the data speak to us and see what more we can, you know, and that's sort of like the art of, of doing all of FMI. In some sense, you develop your analysis based on what you know about the features of the signal and the noise, and then you then you iterate um, and draw insights. But I would just add, so, you know, I was going to say the uh, same thing. I, I think that what we've learned recently is that, yeah, these differences across individuals can be meaningful, you know, and so we should be open to, you know, uh, treating them as such, looking for individual differences, but also, just as Rana said, you know, looking for commonalities as well. I think both questions are interesting and important. Obviously, hard to do this uh, <laughs> with such high resolution kind of LSLR data, but... You know, but the point is looking for both, you know, potential meaningful individual differences and similarities. You know, I would like to add one, one point, which is uh, um, making it even a bit broader. Namely, we are so lucky that fMRI gives us both what people get in a much weaker way, of course, with electrode recordings to say this is the receptive field or the tuning curve. At the same time, we get what optical imaging gets. We get a map. And even in depth, not just at the superficial part with a camera on top of the cortex. This is remarkable. And therefore, if you see a two monkey, an N of two nature paper showing now we found that these neurons do this, they, no one asked them, show me whether the topography in this era is the same across all your monkeys. No one asked them. Right. So therefore, I'm just going to say, we have such an amazing tool that we can ask both kinds of questions. Mm. Like what, what is the coding principle and what is the organizational topographic representational space, right? In terms of combining subjects and data, just the actual act of doing it, it's always been difficult when you have your structural images that have gray-white contrast like MP2 rage versus the EPI images that might have poor contrast or even more problematic is a small region like the grace, which doesn't have large features to use the line. Uh, um, Renzo has shown uh, very nicely with the high resolution 3D EPI that you, you can use the actual native map that the fMR is coming from for uh, structural alignment. And I think this is very promising. And, and, and so in terms of actually being able to combine data, I think it will be possible at this mesoscale. And it's a really huge issue, like to get the alignment very correctly. Like usually, like it, this is maybe does not find its way into the academic literature so much because it's not really research or, or, or science. It's more kind of how to hack your, your software tool or whatever. So, so, but it's an incredibly hard task for the person actually doing it. David is absolutely right. And like sometimes it takes weeks to, to align it and then manually correct the segmentation and it, it's uh, huge limitations and any kind of methodological tweak can help a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a lot. I mean, it's always been a, a thought of mine is that it's right. I mean, at some point, right, the you have a long enough readout window, it's high field, you're always going to get a little bit of warping. And, you know, why not not really worry about that and right, make your high resolution images with the same readout window weight, like, and just exactly superimpose them. That's been an idea around for like 20 years in, in some degree, but it's, but it's finally sort of people are getting it in some senses that, and certainly if you don't have to, you know, necessarily put it into Taylor X space uh, or whatever, you, you don't have to, you, you know where the relative features are anyway. So, you know, it might be, that might be a solution in that regard, right? Of course, we know AI will solve all the problems. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, wow, there's so much more to talk about, but I but I know uh, let's. it's probably a good idea to ramp uh, down a, a, a little bit. This has been an amazing discussion. So is there any, there's all kinds of potential directions this can go. So I just want to put forth a question of, you know, are there, what types of, I mean, certainly there's many types of questions you can ask about cognitive control and top down and bottom up feedback. You know, potentially Reiner can apply this to even neurofeedback, you know, doing neurofeedback experiments with layer MRI. Are there, what are there, you know, what, what do you think the future is? Um, clinical applications even, or, or research applications, or both? This, this uh, new, neurofeedback, which you, which you mentioned, uh, and, and just this afternoon did a, uh, we assume uh, uh, and, and, and helping a little bit from outside in a scan. And it was a neurofeedback experiment, which, which a new type of neurofeedback we develop currently that is uh, only working on 7T, also close to be at the lamina level. And the idea is that we, we use representational similarity. So, so not just saying uh, in the classical way, we have an area and it's active so and so much as an as a average response. And then we feedback how strong that area or the connect or the correlation between two areas how strong that is to the subject and the subject figures out how to improve, enhance this or modulate this at will, so to speak. So what we now do is we compare spatial patterns um, uh, uh, like RSA um, um, uh, analysis. And then the cur and we, we in the localizer, we map certain patterns as correlates of certain mental states. This can be being happy, being sad. This can be uh, 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 seeing or imagining faces versus dogs, whatever it is. And then we have multiple, like four at the moment, four different uh, pre-mapped states in the same person. And then actually in the scanner, we do neurofeedback by not sh showing just the amplitude, but by showing a point which indicates how close is the current mental state to one of those which we map in a 2D projected space from the high dimensional patterns. And then you see when your mind changes, you see like your point, which you are now moves yeah, cool. in a semantic map. And therefore, we call it semantic neurofeedback, right? And I think that is only possible, at least in this subcategorical uh, uh, kind of fine, fine grained resolution space only at 70. And now we try to do this even at laminate. We are not that far yet, but we do a kind of first study where in SMA, we give feedback from different layers of, of laminate. And the idea is um, these uh, uh, laminar profiles tend to correlate to, uh, you can decode from them different tasks the person is doing in SMA. SMA is a very nice hub. When you do mental calculation or you, 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 you recite a poem in, internally or you do several different things, we can decode that from a small part of the brain. And right. we can better decode it probably, you just do the basic work now from laminar profiles. That's and now the idea is that we give as feedback differential activity across layers. And then if the person now manages somehow to get the middle layers more active, say in, in, in working memory, like, like your nice study with Finn and, and colleagues and also Renzo, um, and we can kind of try that people learn to pro pro produce certain laminar patterns. And then we can look which other areas suddenly pop up and driving these areas in the way um, David has alluded to. For example, if the middle layers become more active and this area shines up, lights up, then we, we, we can maybe at least have the hypothesis that this area sends pseudo bottom up information, although it's a cortical cortical one, it's not a sensory other area, right? So in that's, that way, neurofeedback might help us to unravel uh, laminar connectivity by, by as a new experimental approach, right? To yes. find that out because you then have not to say do that task, but the subject has to find the task yeah. so that the feedback gets maximized and we can then interpret what's, what's underlying this task it did, what, what became active. And then we can, so to say, let, let the subject explore to activate more the upper, middle, lower layer. And we can then interpret what's happening in the brain. That's, I think, a good 
um, a future vision for lamina fmi in a bit more you know um, innovative way it's not the usual approach and and i, and I love this uh, example because yeah it sort of uh, shows how these techniques can help us to move beyond just you know brain mapping and kind of you know asking localization questions you know where like what part of the brain is responsible for some you know uh, for processing some you know stimulus or task but start to understand brain computation you know models of brain computation understanding you know we we talk a lot about brain circuits you know uh, inputs and outputs but then sort of to put these together into computational models to use fMRI to understand exactly. brain computation i think that's that's an exciting new domain you know kind of moving beyond like the where question you know to maybe the how question you know and i think that's a really exciting new domain now that the tools are in place yeah there's still some issues we need to sort out to kind of get these you know, powerful tools into as many hands as possible. Um, but the point is, yeah, I'm really excited about this uh, direction. Yeah. And, and just, yeah, I keep on, I'm, I'm just finally catching up with what Reiner is saying. I mean, the very act of getting feedback um, is, you know, with upper layer potential activation. I mean, that sort of informs uh, what the function is in that regard. So, so yeah, no, I think, right. I mean, I think that, uh, and, and as you were saying, uh, John, it's not just higher resolution. It's it's really new information. Um, and, sure and that's something different uh, in this regard. So, yeah. I, I, I look at it a little differently. I, I'm thinking about the medical applications, if I were to go a different direction. And um, I, I think that the layer fMRI or mesoscale fMRI looking at activity in the cortex, the distribution of it um, can elucidate, you know, neurocircuitry mechanisms in normal and abnormal neuropsychiatric disorders or even, you know, neurologic disorders, you know, identifying, we have a very difficult time identifying cortical dysplasias, you know, with, with epilepsy, but even uh, autism spectrum disorders are known to have some uh, cortical layer abnormalities. And if we can, if suddenly if we see it once and we have, um, if you will, a biomarker for it or a circuitry marker, this can be very powerful. Uh, even one disease, if we can impact. So I think that we will have medical applications of this field that will be killer applications, really in, 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 that nothing else can do. And this is aside from looking at the, the overall neurocircuitry timing and connectivity of different areas of the brain. So I think it's extremely important for medical imaging. It's not just for neuroscience. Yeah, yeah I totally, I totally agree with, I, I agree with your hope. And I also agree with the idea that fMRI, you know, we're just one killer app uh, application away from getting our foot in the door. I mean, certainly pre-surgical mapping is important and everything, but um, getting our foot in the door truly with the vendors actually uh, taking notice a, a little bit more and realizing, hey, there's a big, there's a big clinical market, and t suddenly you'll, you know, you'll have a new age of fMRI where where the vendors are are helping out uh, with a lot of the development and and dissemination, uh, and and things will take off from there. But it's just one one clinical application away. <laughs> the vendors that make their money on clinical MRI scanners, not neuroscience. They're only a right. handful. They, you know. Two orders of magnitude more MR scanners are sold for clinical, and there, you know, when I first proposed our our, our next Gen seventy scanner, they want to know what are the clinical applications, what could they be, and of course it's basic research, so you can't right. really know. But um, I think everyone, I think if there's just one really big application for seven Tesla, it's going to move um, clinical applications more to seventeen. I think neuroscience is a big. Brain imaging is is a is very ripe for this. Yeah, we have also recently um, um, have a CE certified software now, which we run clinical trials for depression treatment with neuro fMRI neurofeedback. So that can be a, it's a small thing, but it can show that fMRI can lead to 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 unusual uh, treatments, which are quite effective apparently because the same results were also found in, in UK and in, in US. So, so therefore, I think there is something which is quite quite useful. And if there would not be the mobility issue of, of, of the scanner, we have developed a working system, which is a bit like the M of, of, of uh, John's uh, work, which you mentioned earlier. But during imagination, we have a very robust system. If you imagine letters, we can just decode them and show them visually to you during the scan in, in real time. And I mean, that would be wonderful if, for example, lock-in patients 
could just imagine the letters, maybe even the words, but at the moment we are at the stage of letters and can communicate by that. For example, log in patients, that works. And we even talk to people in, in Liège, friends of us here close by, uh, which, which, which work with, with log in patients. And they even have now a 70. So we might even try it at least out on, on real patients. But of course, it will never be, unfortunately, different to, to depression treatment, but anyway, have to go from time to time to treat to, to therapy. And that is then just in the scanner. But here, you want to have it all the time, right? And you want to have it at home. You want to where, where you live and not just the, these hours, which are maybe available to put such a patient for a short moment in the scanner. So I see here a big issue that the uh, mobility of fMRI limits it to EEG, to FNIRS, and all these other techniques, which are much weaker in, this, in these capabilities. Yes. But they are mobile, and therefore they are used, unfortunately, more often for these applications than fMRI. Well, certainly they're working on mobile fMRI, at, uh, potentially at MGH uh, uh, to some degree, but... Uh... Um, Not quite 17 yet, but... Uh. Yeah, yeah I mean, if we have another different contrast mechanism, potentially, uh, uh, or, or low-field neural currents directly. Who yeah, knows? exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I think actually, uh, you know, things... But I'll, but and, and there's the nuts and bolts of getting fMRI. I mean, one might want to bootstrap this up and sort of disseminating, you know, what one big problem is not only fMRI results, but, and not only the mobility, but uh, you have radiologists who just say, well, you know, who are so used to just looking at a grayscale image and seeing a tumor. Uh, and they're like, well, you know, all this processing and all these variables, all these decisions, I don't want to make these, this is hard. Um, I don't want this. And it would be nice to have something like, uh, you know, Brain Voyager Clinical or something that sort of uh, is in the cloud or whatever, and you can just use it, you can install it in your scanner and just boom, images that are that are more curated uh, come out and are interpretable. That would help, I think, catalyze that clinical applications potentially. So things yeah, like we tried that. exactly to go that way with this clinical software, which is the brain virtualized at the, at the basis, at the back end, but it has completely new interface. It's completely mm -hmm. clinical uh, in the sense it's, it guides you through the whole process from the scanner to the analysis to the final effects and so on. So I think that goes a bit in this direction. That's actually, yes. we, we do this in a small scale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. That's a, sort of a hopeful. I think this is a really important point that the, the radiologists are used to looking at uh, images quickly and integrating the visual information, and they don't use uh, functional information, even cardiac MRI. It's very time consuming, and they're under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, I can say this if I put on, I'm a neuroradiologist. I later I went that direction for a short while, but now I'm, an, I'm really an MR physicist. But I can tell you it's difficult to, with the pressures of doing radiology or neuroradiology to spend a lot of time uh, analyzing functional information. And the, but, but, the, but there are other fields like the neurologist who can focus and do that kind of analysis. And so, but I think once there's a powerful tool for diagnostic imaging, um, it, 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 it cannot be suppressed and it will be used. And it's, um, I think that in general, MRI, and, and I think the value of fMRI is that we never could see something that we could put um, a, a label on, like a broken bone. I think Bruce Rosen made this comment once in a talk. You know, radiology or medicine, you need to see something to treat it. And just having neuropsychiatric disorders are very vague, but we actually have uh, fMRI findings that show spatially the abnormalities. And I think that's the way layer fMRI is very powerful too, but on a cortical level, uh, a much, uh, and that after all is where all the neuronal, a lot of the neuronal processing is being done. So I think it's huge potential. Yeah, completely agree. All right, well, um, I think we've covered a ton of ground. Uh, obviously there's many, many more things that would be wonderful to talk about maybe in a future date, but um, I just won't take up any more, many more of your time. Uh, we've already, uh, yeah, we've gone almost two hours and I really do appreciate this. This has been a great discussion <laughs> and the time has flown. It feels like 10 minutes to me, but uh, all right, well, well, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any, any other uh, parting words, but uh, advice to young researchers or uh, hopeful thoughts or anything like if that. You, if you want to know about the grace contrast mechanisms, which I didn't answer, there's a recent paper <laughs> out last month, <laughs> Mac Resin Medicine by Klaus Scheffler and, and the Tübingen okay. group. And I think it explains very nicely the small vessel uh, sensitivity and the trade-offs in grace compared to EPI. 
Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So, all right, so much more literature. Renzo, keep on uh, keeping that list of papers since I, I rely on that uh, on your website, uh, your brain fMRI, um, your layer fMRI. Uh, uh, I don't know how much longer you can keep that up because the field's probably gonna start exploding, but um, we'll see. It is exploding quite a bit, yeah. It's, it's hard, to, they need to help us maybe sometime, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. And actually, the list, I need to update it. It's uh, two months old already, and there have been at least <laughs> like 15 papers out there. But it's a good thing, yeah. And I think it, it shows that layer fMRI lost its innocence. Now it's it's being useful. And then there's a long way to go now to like, get it out there and maybe like in, in the clinic and then make it practical and stable. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah Renzo's, Renzo's grant has this mission statement, which uh, brought him to, to our lab, that he wants to bring layer fMRI into clinical applications. That's just, is, right? Isn't it right, Renzo? It is, yes. It's a bit of a bold claim, but uh, I think it's definitely at the horizon. I know like there, there are three, no, six uh, review papers about applications in, in, in the clinical context. There's not so much data yet. It, yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's awesome. I mean, that's a certainly, obviously, uh, that's the goal for a lot of this. I mean, obviously, I was saying the brain is a fundamental goal, but clinical applications is, is, a, is a real uh, application, a real goal that, that we should all be keep in mind as well. So, and it's nice to know, I mean, with this new information, there might be, you know, hooks uh, that we haven't realized yet that could be clinical applications. All right, well, well, thank you all for, for spending the time talking. This has really been an informative, uh, really fun discussion. And uh, I wish you all the best. Look forward to seeing you at the meetings in person in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Mike.